Hi, this is your host, Swapnil Bhartia, and welcome to another episode of TFR Let's Talk. And today we have with us Matt Butcher, CEO of Fermion. Matt, it's great to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks so much for having me today. Uh, we have been covering the company uh, WebAssembly a lot since you are here. So I want to kind of revisit the topic. First of all, talk a bit about what is WebAssembly? I think I've heard a couple different definitions, but I think the one that makes the most sense to me is just to look at WebAssembly as a, a compile target, right? We talk about compiling to one native format versus another. Uh, we talk about in Java compiling to bytecode. I think WebAssembly is best understood as sort of falling in that Java or .NET ecosystem, but with one really important difference. So, uh, and that's security related. In in uh, Java or in .NET, typically uh, when you when you execute and when you compile and execute a program on behalf of a user, your default disposition is to, is to trust that user, uh, trust that guest code. In WebAssembly, which was originally built for the browser, the default disposition is to not trust the code that you're executing. And so the WebAssembly runtime offers this really nice security layer. Talk a bit about uh, the adoption of this technology what was the original intention, mostly you know, WebAssembly for a browser, but do you also see that it is going beyond that specific intended use case? Because that is what happens in most cases. We create technologies to solve a specific problem, but when it goes to the market, folks start using in the places where we did not even imagine initially, and that's how a lot of projects like these grow. So talk about it. Yeah, and I think WebAssembly is a great example, yet again, of one of those technologies that started in one area and has really sort of expanded out into what I would categorize as four. So the first one of those is the one it was intended for, right? Uh, being able to use it in browser to do things maybe more sophisticated than what you can do with JavaScript or something that uh, is really tooled particularly well to a particular programming language. So the you know ca canonical case there is Figma. Right. They wrote a lot of code in C++ that's very high performance graphics code. They compile it to WebAssembly and they run it on the browser side. The second big category is IoT and, and Far Edge, uh, where WebAssembly is built to run on various felt devices that don't have uh, you know, huge processors or a lot of memory. And I think it works really well in that kind of environment. And I think we'll see a lot of usage there. The third one is what one of my friends calls the last plugin technology we'll ever need. And this is the idea that WebAssembly uh, really provides a nice kind of uh, security boundary plus really easy API extension mechanism that would allow different platforms like Envoy Proxy, as a great example, a way to easily add on, uh, you know, a, a plugin infrastructure where developers can bring their own extensions and run them in a secure and, and fault tolerant kind of way. But the one that I am the most excited about, the fourth one, is the potential to run WebAssembly on the cloud. And, uh, you know, being a longtime cloud person involved in OpenStack and then Kubernetes and the container ecosystem, uh, one of the things that I really recognize and appreciate about cloud technology is that fundamentally what you want is a, uh, in a compute runtime, right, is, is an environment in which you can execute something safely. And then you can begin to, you know, as, as the, the sort of, uh, uh, the way that Amazon used to talk about it way back in the old days is like you're renting your servers out to someone else because then you, then they can run uh, their own applications on your stuff and there's low risk. From the customer perspective, really, it's, it's the converse, right? You want to be able to write the code that you want to write and run it somewhere else and not have to worry that somebody else running on that same platform could somehow, you know, tinker with uh, with your code. We used to call it at Azure, at Microsoft Azure, the Pepsi Coke test. Can you run Pepsi and Coke, both websites, both on the same piece? of uh, of hardware and know that your isolation models are so good that both will be able to run side by side without any perceived conflict. And, and WebAssembly, I think what really got us interested in it was as longtime cloud developers who were looking to solve particular scenarios, WebAssembly really hit that same server side profile for us that containers did and that virtual machines did, but then WebAssembly has some different uh, benefits in that in that regard, right? The performance of WebAssembly is just astonishing, which means you can start it up in sub one millisecond. And that means we can start to build a better foundation for serverless and functions as a service style infrastructures with WebAssembly than we've been able to do with virtual machines and containers. You know, I think uh, touched upon the next question that I was going to ask, if you feel that you want to go a bit deeper, which was more or less like a comparison with virtual machines or uh, containers? 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think that the way I like to conceive of the, the difference between these layers is that virtual machines are sort of like the heavyweight class of cloud compute, right? You package up from the kernel and drivers all the way through your application code with everything in between into one big package. You upload it onto somebody else's uh, server environment, right? Their cloud. And then you can execute that entire thing. I think that virtual machines are just they're they're going to be they're going to be around forever, right? Uh, because they solve such a critical piece of this cloud infrastructure. But they're heavyweight. They're the heavyweight class. I think you can kind of take a step over to the right and look at containers and say, all right, well, uh, containers, you don't have to include the kernel. You don't need the drivers. You only need sort of a subset of the core operating system when you package everything up. And so they're really more like a middleweight class of cloud computing. Uh, they Instead of taking minutes to start up like a full-size virtual machine does, they tend to take seconds to start up, maybe a dozen seconds, maybe, you know, 30 or 40 on the higher end, right? Um and and one of the big benefits of them is they allow a nice, easy application encapsulation where you can take an existing application, package it up as a container and run it. So as we kind of laid those things out on, on my team, we said, OK, well, if we've got a heavyweight class and we've got a, a middleweight class, what's the lightweight class, right? What's there that, that we can just package up the bare minimum of things uh, and be able to get, you know, faster startup times, make it easier to move them around the data center or from device to device. And that's where WebAssembly fit for us. It's the lightweight version, right? Instead of taking seconds or minutes to start up, takes an, under a millisecond. But then you also don't package up, you know, a lot of the file system or, or uh, things like that that you do with, with Docker images. And also, at least at this point in the WebAssembly ecosystem, and, and you always have to acknowledge the weaknesses of any of these technologies, right? But right now, it is not so easy to take an application and sort of lift and shift it into WebAssembly. It often does require at least a little bit of adjustment of the code, in some cases, uh, quite a bit of adjustment to the code to be able to run it in this new environment. Now, I don't know if that set of circumstances will persist, but it is something that marks WebAssembly as being very early in the technology cycle right now. And it's the kind of thing that Fermion is just, we're all in on trying to figure out how to solve this and what the right applications are for today. And then how that'll become, you know, what the right applications will be for tomorrow as the specifications begin to get more robust. So if I ask you, what are the use cases or what are the right applications? Because as you also mentioned, I mean, if you look at the, we have been talking about digital transformation, cloud native for a long time. Folks have been still trying to containerize their, you know, legacy workload, and we are talking about WebAssembly. So, so let's talk about what are the use cases where you feel that hey, this is where WebAssembly makes more sense, and that, that's that's the the journey folks should make. And then also talk about some of the pain points or hurdles that you're talking about, which are there, which are either you're like, hey, you know what? These are the early stages that can be solved, or these are the big ones that can be, you know. So that's why. It, depending on the use cases where it's ideal, that's where the effort should be put. And I think for me right now, the the most exciting use case for WebAssembly on the cloud side is in the kind of serverless functions world, right? Uh, you know, at, at Microsoft, you know, I was in this kind of privileged position where I got to talk to customers, got to talk to internal people, went to all, a lot of uh, conferences and open source events. And repeatedly when I would talk to people about what they were excited about in serverless, they would talk about Lambda and Azure Functions and some of these hosted environments. And they would say, I just love the programming model. It's so easy to dive right into the business logic with these kinds of things. But they would always then say, but, you know, there are a couple things I really don't like. The, the debugging experience is hard. The packaging experience is hard. The operation is counterintuitive. It doesn't sit with the rest of my applications. I kind of have to treat it as one off and over on the side. And, you know, they would always conclude by saying, and I don't like the vendor lock-in, right? And so as we started looking at WebAssembly and trying to build this third category of cloud computing, uh, the the first candidate for us, the very exciting candidate, was to say, yeah, we can do this serverless functions thing really easily. Even with WebAssembly still being a maturing technology, it already is an ideal candidate for that kind of solution. And so we've really focused a lot of our efforts there on, on building that story, on making it really, really easy to build microservices with WebAssembly and to build sort of the back end of web applications with WebAssembly. That for us is what we think, uh, you know, at least for the next year, year and a half, that's the prime application of WebAssembly on the cloud is just addressing those problems and making it easier and easier for developers to build, uh, you know, serverless style microservices and web applications with WebAssembly. 
Now, with that on the on the pro con, uh, the pro side, right? What's on the con side? What are the things you probably shouldn't try and do with WebAssembly? Well, to get there, we can mention a couple of the specifications that are working their way through W3, and then see why why until those are done, you'll have some limitations. Uh, W3, W3C is the standards body that standardizes HTML and CSS, and it's also the standards body that standardizes WebAssembly. And the core of the WebAssembly specification has been done for years now. In fact, WebAssembly is currently on version two of its specification. Uh, but there were a number of things that weren't considered to be included in the core. Uh, one of those is threading. Uh, one of them is a universal garbage collector. Uh, some of it is uh, ways of handling large math, uh, mathematical operations. So there are specifications mo working their way through W3 that will address each of these. Uh, but as I'm, I'm sure, as you're listening and as I'm saying some of these things, you're thinking, well, you know, threading seems like the kind of thing you'd really want if you were going to run a large, long, long running process or, or a long run or, or build a database or something like that. Uh, you know, numerical calculations for large numbers are the kinds of things you really want in data science. And I do think that that's, uh, th those are the kinds of applications where uh, their WebAssembly is not yet right to do that kind of stuff. Now, there's one specification that I'm really excited about working its way through W3, and it's called in a, in a rather, in, uh, you know, unglorious, inglorious kind of title. It's called the component model. But this is, uh, this is one that will allow two different WebAssembly binaries to communicate with each other securely via the host runtime. And that sounds kind of vague and, and a little bit, you know, abstract. But the idea of that would be that we would start being able to write language, uh, write our libraries in one language and compile them into a WebAssembly binary and access them easily from another uh, WebAssembly module. So you you would suddenly have the opportunity to do things like write a high performance Rust implementation of an algorithm and import it into a C++ library, which then exposes its own APIs that can then be used from JavaScript and have all of this done kind of seamlessly in the back end. So while it can't be done today, that spec is moving very quickly, and I'm really optimistic that it'll be done, uh, you know, in 2023, and that will really sort of open the floodgates of all these new and unique applications of WebAssembly that we simply can't do in really any language ecosystem right now. So talk about, you know, Fermion's, you know, engagement and involvement with these kind of open source projects as well. Fermion has been highly involved in lots of different open source work. A lot of us came from an open source background. Uh, not a lot of us. All of the engineering team came from an open source background. Right, I, I was the uh, one of the founders of the Helm project. Uh, we did the Illustrated Children's Guide to Kubernetes. We did a whole bunch of CNCF projects, and so we are and always will be really active in CNCF. We'll be active in Bytecode Alliance. Uh, we regularly allocate engineering time to work on projects and under both of those umbrellas. And really, I, and I don't say that to you know to sort of to sort of be trite about the importance of this kind of thing, right? Uh, we the WebAssembly is so early that there's this opportunity to really influence the direction of the ecosystem. And when we can be thoughtful and really work hard in these kinds of contributions, the, the, the impact of this really multiplies. You know, if you look at Kubernetes now, it is so sophisticated and so big that even a hundred line PR seems very small compared to, uh, to, to the size of the code base. But when we were involved in Kubernetes years ago, right, a hundred line PR could change the, the, the way that Kubernetes was working. And we think that we're really at that same level right now with WebAssembly where it's growing, the core is still maturing. And so it's a great time to be involved in open source with WebAssembly. Talk a bit about how are you seeing the evolution of the ecosystem around WebAssembly? And then let's talk about what value is Fermion bringing to the table? Because the, uh, you know most of these are open source project, but we are solving specific problem for specific user, or it could be you know what solving a wider problem, irrespective of what the use case could be. I like to think when I think of the ecosystem with WebAssembly, uh, my natural tendency from where I've been most recently would have been to compare it to Docker and the container ecosystem. But really, when I have to when I take a step back and I look at it more objectively, I would have to liken it to maybe like the early Java ecosystem. Uh, you know, early, early Java from back. I started my career as a Java developer, early, early Java 1.0, 1.1. And at that point, you know, embedded was supposed to be the big area for Java to go into. And yet very quickly, people embraced it as a general pur purpose programming language. And then we started to see it go into the browser and then into the server side. And it, it just sort of like uh, boomed and exploded way out. And probably these days, 
Embedded is probably one of the less frequently uh, use, used uh, use cases for Java. And WebAssembly, I really think, you know, is similar ecosystem-wise to that, where uh, the general purp purposeness of WebAssembly is really starting to hit right now. So we're seeing a, a, an ecosystem form around WebAssembly proper. But within that ecosystem are chunks of, of, of companies that are working in other ecosystems, right? So we consider ourselves to be in the CNCF ecosystem where we're really more interested in what cloud native development looks like, uh, microservice development, web applications. It just so happens that WebAssembly seemed like the right fit for us. But if you go to, say, uh, Profion, who's doing security, right, they're definitely in the WebAssembly ecosystem contributing with Bytecode Alliance. But... They're also in that security ecosystem uh, where they where they work a lot on trusted compute. And you can talk about single store and databases. And so I think we're going to see, just like with early Java, this explosion of a whole bunch of organizations that are working on uh, WebAssembly, but, you know, sort of connected to other ecosystems. And that's both kind of exciting and terrifying, right? It's exciting because it means we will all work together to build a good general purpose platform, which is what we need. But it's a little terrifying because then it gets convoluted about how everybody's here and you're trying to position yourself as a, we as at Fermion, right, are trying to position ourselves as a good player within the WebAssembly ecosystem and also as part of the cloud native ecosystem. And your messaging gets a little complex and stuff like that. Uh, so, but it is just, it's a really exciting thing to see this community take off in this particular way. Uh, so I, I have high hopes that what we'll see over the next, you know, year, year to two years is, you know, the the sum of this WebAssembly work will remain in the separate ecosystems. Right. But more the majority of it, I think, especially with things like the component model and the threading model and these core pieces of specification, the majority of the movement in WebAssembly is really going to benefit all of those different groups within the broader WebAssembly ecosystem. Matt, thank you so much for taking time out today. And uh, I really appreciate this this detailed, in-depth discussion around WebAssembly, you know, of course, use cases, uh, the challenges that are there. And I would love to have you back on the show. Thank you. Thank you. It was an absolute pleasure. I'd love to come back. <laughs>